Welcome everybody. I'm just sharing my screen and um, I think people are flooding in as we speak. Um, welcome to the York English Language uh, Toolkit CPD webinar for teachers of English Language A-Level um, for 2022. We're really um, pleased to have you all here. This is our seventh annual CPD workshop. Um, and the third that we've hosted in an online format. So we're again excited that um, so many people can be involved um, from all over the UK. And I think we've got some people who may be joining from overseas as well. You'll have a chance to tell us in a moment where you're zooming in from. If you are a Twitter user, you can uh, use the uh, oops, hashtag uh, YorkCPD2022 um, so that we can see what you have to say about the workshop. To avoid sound problems, we've muted your microphones for now, but we encourage you to switch on your camera if you can, uh, because then you'll be able to see each other. You might like to switch your view so it's on speaker view so that you can see the slides and whoever's speaking, though, uh, um, other than in any points when we're in discussion. I've enabled the live transcript on the meeting, um, but if you don't want to see that, you can disable it using uh, the if you find the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, you can choose to hide the subtitles. So we love being able to reach a wider audience with online format, but we wanted to make things a bit more interactive. Um, so after each talk uh, this year, um, there'll be a five minute quiz with our, um, after each talk from the speakers, there'll be a five minute quiz. We're going to explain uh, more about that in a moment. The idea is to give you a chance to check your understanding live in the meeting while there's still an opportunity to um, ask questions. And this also gives you a taste of some of the tasks that you might get your students to do using our classroom our materials. Um, because all the um, all the tasks we're going to get you to do are taken from the classroom materials. So after each talk and then a little yeah. quiz, there'll also be time for questions to the speaker. Um, so you can uh, put your uh, um, questions in the chat at any point. Don't you don't need to wait for the question period. If it comes to mind, put it in the chat when it, it comes there. And then we've got um, some people wrangling the questions behind the scenes who will uh, make sure that we put as many of them as we can to the speakers. But we'll post answers to all of your questions after the workshop. Also, after the three talks, we've, we've, we think we'll have about 10 minutes available for a bit of time to, for you to meet each other and have a chance to talk to each other as well and compare notes on what you've taken from the talks and then discuss any final questions before the end of the day. Um, you may wonder why we have a squirrel here. So one of our workshops in the past in person was disrupted by the presence of a lovely squirrel coming to steal fruit from the uh, the, the sandwiches table and an advantage of online format is that we won't be interrupted by squirrels but if we have any technical issues um, we ask for your forbearance with those um, and, and if you have any technical issues please don't worry just uh, leave and come back as you need to um, we'll put the video on the website afterwards so you won't miss out um, we've got three case studies for you, uh, all related to the linguistics of English language and based on the latest research from our own department, presented in each case by the authors of that research. So these really are the experts on the topic and do ask them all the questions that you need to. The pre-workshop materials on our website included a taste of video for each case study, plus links to a stack of classroom materials and explainer videos and other information um, that you can use and download for your own use. And we encourage you to take a good look at all of that after the workshop. Um, but you'll have a chance to try out some of them during the workshop today. So um, to get that set up, we're going to start off with a little opening quiz. Uh, we're using the online interactive quiz platform Mentimeter and there will be a prize free uh, classroom posters for the top three highest scoring participants. Um, if you were here early, you might have seen this already um, uh, during the opening video, but if, if not, you can see the URL on the screen there. You need to open up another browser window or another device, perhaps your phone, and make your way to www.menti.com and enter the code 86095166. Um, or you can use the QR code on screen if that works for you. And we'll do, there's like a round of questions 
after each talk, a bit like a pub quiz, um, but no beer or sandwiches, sorry. Um, so keep that window logged in and open throughout. Don't, don't sort of navigate away from that. Keep, keep that open because we'll come back to it at each time after each talk. So I'm going to hand over to George now, who is going to um, get us started with the first quiz questions. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, so hopefully you can all see this. This is just a reminder of the, the joining instructions. Uh, so yeah, you can either go to the website and enter the, the access code, or you can scan the QR code if you've got a phone that lets you do that. So I'm just going to try that now. Um, and yeah, so if you join, you should see a little like button so you can you know, share the love um, and give us a like while we're waiting. Um, so there will be some questions which have a right or wrong answer and, you know, there'll be a semi-competitive element to that um, and also some questions which are more just um, open and a reflection. So let's go to the first question. Uh, so the first thing we want to know is actually where you're all zooming in from. Um, so hopefully, if this works, you should be able to place a pin on the map. Um, now, this is an English language workshop, not a geography workshop. Um, so there's no labels on the map. So depending on how good your geography is, this might be difficult. I'm just going to put mine roughly there. OK, so we've got a nice little mix um, from the north and the south. Beautiful, it works. Great, so um, I'll just give you a second. Oh, we have more coming in. Nobody from Scotland, yeah, or oh, Wales, or oh, the islands. Oh, yeah, there we go. Cool, so let's get to the first, uh, I guess, proper question. Now, at this point, you should be prompted to enter a username. Um, and just be aware, the username will come up in the leaderboard. So, you know, pick something which you don't mind people seeing. And you also get assigned a nice little profile picture, it would seem. OK, so are we all in? Oh, one thing I should say also is that you get bonus points for how quickly you answer. OK, so it's a bit of a fastest fingers first as well. Okay, we'll do the first question. Who is the famous sociolinguist from the list below? It's a nice easy one, really. Is it Dr. Lynn Gwist? Is it Noam Chomsky? Or is it William LeBoff? There you go. Maybe it wasn't that easy. <laughs> So most of you got it right, William LeBov. Noam Chomsky is a famous linguist, of course. Um, probably wouldn't describe him as a sociolinguist. Okay, so you can see the leaderboard. I don't even make the top 10. I was too busy talking to answer. Well done, good by Calvin for now. Okay, a second question, and then we'll get on with the talks. So this one's a bit of trivia about LeBov himself. So before a career in social linguistics, what job did he hold? There you go. Maybe you've learned something today. He was a chemist. Most of you got that correct. Let's see what that does to the scores on the doors. Interesting. Okay, so that is the end of the little intro round. So you get an idea of how uh, the quiz will work. We'll return to this after each um, talk as well with some questions. Um, but for now, I will stop sharing. And um, I will hand over to Catherine, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, George. Um, so Chris, if you would like to share your screen. Um, so I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce Chris Cox who is a PhD student at Aarhus University in Denmark. 
but he has co-supervision at the University of York, where he also completed his undergraduate and his master's degrees. His research investigates how children acquire the sounds of their first language, and I will pass the floor to him as he presents his work on infant-directed speech. Thank you, Chris. Great, thank you, Catherine. Can everyone hear me? And yeah, great. Good, so I'm here to talk about infant-directed speech across time and space, and to present some findings from a recent meta-analysis that we did on the properties of infant-directed speech. So just a quick overview of the talk to begin with. Um, I'll start out, so here are examples of caregivers interacting with their infants and situations where we might expect them to speak with infant-directed speech. And I'll start out by providing some background on infant-directed speech. So talk about what it is and what we mean by infant-directed speech. And then talk about, well, why do adults and caregivers actually modify their speech to infants? What purpose does it serve? Does it serve various functions during infant development? We'll then turn to the study that we did, um, which asked two main questions. So this is the meta-analysis. And we started out by asking questions about space. So do different languages express infant-directed speech with different properties? And then also about time. So do the properties of infant-directed speech change as the infant grows older? And this second question we use also to tell us about um, functions, or we investigate uh, whether this can tell us anything about the functions of infant-directed speech during development. Great. So let's start from the start and ask probably the most basic question we can, which is what is infant-directed infant directed speech? And at its most basic level, right, it's a speech style that caregivers use to address and interact with young infants. And you may have heard of child-directed speech, um, which is the same, except we use infant-directed speech to refer to um, infants that are a bit younger, so between zero months and 24 months of age. And a useful way to construe infant-directed speech is as a sort of a sense of accommodation to the linguistic immaturity of the infant. So infant-directed speech might help caregivers to express emotions and to express their intentions to linguistically immature infants. Um, so in this sense, it's about creating an emotional communion between the caregiver and the infant in the process of interaction. And we should also note that infant-directed speech is also accompanied by, by a variety of other things. So exaggerated facial expressions and exaggerated gestures, they're all, they all form part of this um, speech style, you could say. Yes. And one of the interesting things about infant-directed speech is that we have quite strong intuitions about this speech style. Um, and I thought I would put this to the test um, to start out with. So I'll play you two speech samples, um, A and B. And it's your job to tell me which one is infant directed and which one is adult directed. So we'll start with the first one. What do you think? Can we roll the ball? Yeah, you can put it on your head like a hat. It's got white stars. It's this. Okay, and here comes speech sample B. Slightly bigger, but squishy in the same way. It's it's just a blue kind of basketball. Okay, so if you put your hand up, if you think speech sample A was infant directed. Okay, I can see some of you on the screen, but uh, most of you uh, are putting your hand up, indicating that um, that it's infant directed, and indeed it was. Um, and this is quite an this highlights something interesting about infant directed speech, right? Because this speech sample is from U.S. English, and the majority of us, as we saw in the um, Mentimeter quiz, are from um, the British Isles meaning that we can recognize that uh, a, speech, a given speech sample is infant-directed, even if it's not our variety of English. And this brings us to my next point of looking at infant-directed speech across cultures. And if we look at infant-directed speech, so I'll, I'll refer to this as IDS in the remained, rain, remainder of this presentation. But if we look across cultures and across languages, we see these striking similarities in terms of their properties. So both in terms of the acoustics, meaning like the sound properties of the speech style. We see an elevated pitch, a slower articulation rate um, in a lot of these uh, languages of the world. We also see similarities in terms of the structural features of infant-directed speech, which is um, so shorter utterances. We see simplified vocabulary and so forth. 
And here's a map from the paper, um, so the meta-analysis of infant-directed speech. And here we um, show a map of all of the languages for which IDS has been investigated. So uh, the languages in with orange dots have been investigated for infant-directed speech, and the ones in blue have not been investigated for infant-directed speech. And we see here a, um, a clear pattern or a clear bias in terms of the languages that have been investigated. So we see US English has a big orange dot, Canadian English, New Zealand English, and we see a lot of the European languages, so Germanic languages, Romance languages, sort of overrepresented in studies that have been conducted on IDS, um, infant directed speech. And I'll return to this point um, later on in the presentation. Okay. So we see these striking similarities in terms of the acoustic and structural features of infant directed speech, but we see quite a lot of cross cultural variation in the quantity of IDS. So how much caregivers actually um, use um, or use infant directed speech. So some recent studies on um, on the quantity of infant directed speech have been conducted by Casillas and Bergelson um, and colleagues where they looked at a Mayan culture in Mexico, uh, and they found that, inf or that caregivers uh, addressed their infants with infant-directed speech only about three and a half minutes per hour. And this is quite striking in terms of when we compare this to um, US English, where they receive almost three times as much infant-directed speech um, during development. So these results suggest that Infant directed speech is this continuum that exhibits variability both in how it sounds, so in terms of its properties, in terms of its sound properties, but also in the amount it's actually used. Yes. And now we've talked a bit about the properties of, of infant directed speech and how widespread it is, but we also need to think a bit about the functions of infant directed speech. So the question is why do we actually modify our speech to infants? And the fact that it's so widespread across distinct languages and cultures um, suggests that it might serve some functions during development. And researchers have proposed three main functions. So the first of which is that infant-directed speech might help caregivers communicate emotions and intentions better. It may also engage infant attention um, in a more effective way. So I have a graph here from a um, multi-lab study of infant-directed speech, um, where they uh, looked at the extent to which infants prefer to listen to infant-directed speech over adult-directed speech. And here, a positive number indicates that they prefer to listen to infant-directed speech as opposed to adult-directed speech. And this graph shows that infants actually show a linear increase right, from four months to 14 months that they actually prefer to listen to infant-directed speech. So this suggests that if you really want to grab infants' attention, then infant-directed speech is the way to go. Okay, a third function of infant-directed speech is that it might facilitate linguistic development. It might make the task of learning language easier. Um, yes. And common to all three of these functions of infant-directed speech is that it arises from the interaction between the caregiver and the infant. So the caregiver is reacting to the infant's responses and the infant is reacting to the caregiver responses. It's a very important point um, that it arises in the interaction uh, between the caregiver and the infant. Over the course of development, we also see a shift in terms of infant's preferences for certain properties in the speech style. So we, we see that younger infants prefer positive emotions in the speech style, whereas um, older infants prefer to attend to the linguistic information. They don't care much about the emotional content of the speech. So now we'll turn to the study and talk a bit about how we investigated infant-directed speech. And we used, or we conducted a large-scale meta-analysis. And the main point of a meta-analysis is to synthesize the evidence on a given topic. So, Meta-analyses specifically use quantitative results from studies that have already been conducted that address similar questions. So in our case, the properties of infant-directed speech. And here's a diagram of how meta-analyses work. So um, researchers uh, conduct studies on a given group of participants, and these researchers then publish a study. And a meta-analysis pools together all of these results from all these individual studies that have been conducted um, to synthesize the evidence on a given topic. 
So our meta-analysis looks at uh, 30s or 40 years of research into the properties of infant-directed speech. And we look at, or we synthesize evidence from 88 studies, 734 estimates, so results from these studies. Um, and these studies actually comprise 33 distinct languages. So it's a very big um, endeavor that we embarked on. And as I said, these uh, results are synthesized in using robust statistical methods. Um, yes. And in order to standardize um, the measures, so because different studies use different measures, we um, uh, calculated something called an effect size. And what an effect size is, is basically asking how different are infant directed speech properties and adult directed speech properties. So we're quantifying the difference between these two speech styles in terms of their properties, their sound properties. So here a positive effect size means a higher value in IDS than in ADS, so adult directed speech and vice versa. And this will become more clear when I go through the results. So in a sense, we're quantifying how um, we're using adult directed speech as a baseline and then quantifying uh, the extent to which IDS exaggerates certain properties in relation to adult directed speech. Okay. Now, some of the main aims of this meta analysis were to investigate how IDS differs across languages. So, do different languages express infant directed speech differently? And then also how the um, properties of infant directed speech change with infant age. So to what extent do we speak to older infants in a different way than to younger infants, for example. And we also asked um, these questions in order to better understand the functions of IDS. So the title of this slide is a form function correspondence. So by looking at the form of speech, right, look, by looking at the properties of infant directed speech, we aim to better understand the functions of infant directed speech because there is this correspondence between form and function. Okay. So we looked at four main properties of infant directed speech. Um, so we looked at pitch, which is known to be elevated in infant directed speech as opposed to adult directed speech. We also looked at pitch variability. So we use more melodic phrases in infant directed speech as opposed to adult directed speech. We looked at speech rate which is slower in infant-directed speech as opposed to adult-directed speech. And then we looked at vowel space area, which is um, perhaps the most unintuitive concept of these, of these four um, properties. And there's a great introductory video on vowel space area made by Ben on the website, but I'll go through the um, vowel space area measure uh, quickly here. So the idea is that uh, caregivers uh, produce um, exact or they exaggerate the distinctions between vowel categories in their infant direct directed speech. So this would be the vowel space area of adult directed speech, so normal speech. But in infant directed speech, um, caregivers have been shown to exaggerate the distinctions between these individual vowel categories. So this measure has been claimed to be a um, measure of uh, the extent to which caregivers clarify their speech to infants. Great. So we have certain expectations, or we had certain expectations about the functions of infant-directed speech, um, and whether we could see them in the form of infant-directed speech. So based on the literature that we just reviewed as well, um, there's a tendency to think about infant-directed speech as first serving socio-emotional functions, so being about communicating intentions, and then later, at a later point in development serving linguistic functions, so um, allowing the infant to acquire the speech faster. And if we have this expectation about the function of infant-directed speech, we would expect to see a decrease in the emotional properties of the speech style, and to see an increase in the linguistic properties of the speech style. So as the infant grows older and starts to produce and understand speech to a greater extent, we might expect caregivers to subconsciously exaggerate the linguistic properties of the speech style. Great. So now we can look at some of the results. Um, and the overall pattern in the result is that uh, some of the acoustic features exhibit change. So here we have a graph of pitch. So all of these uh, gray dots are the individual estimates from individual studies. And we can see here that it, generally we see a pitch decreasing over the course of early infant development. So the effect size becomes closer to zero 
over the as the infant grows older. So this indicates that caregivers uh, produce a less exaggerated pitch in infant directed speech as the infant grows older. Similarly, with articulation rate, we see a negative effect size indicating that caregivers are producing slower speech in infant directed uh, speech. Um, and as the infant grows older, they produce gradually faster speech. Great. Now, other acoustic features exhibit stability. So if we look at pitch variability, we see simply a straight line. So as the infant grows older from between zero and 36 months of age, we see the pitch variability of infant directed speech being the same. So they continue to exaggerate uh, pitch variability in infant directed speech when compared to adult directed speech. Similarly, for vowel space area, we see this stable um, line. So the indicating that caregivers exaggerate the vowels uh, even as the infants grow older. Um, yes. And here's another graph showing um, the effect sizes uh, with colors. So the more orange the uh, square, the stronger the effect size. And here we'll look at the same um, acoustic properties. So if we look at pitch here, we see that almost all of the uh, squares here are orange. So across all of these distinct languages, from Australian English to US English, we see quite strong patterns of exaggerating pitch for these languages. Similarly, for pitch variability, we see moderate effects, more moderate effect sizes. So they're not as orange as the ones we see to the left. But for pitch variability, we see similarly that um, caregivers tend to exaggerate the pitch variability in their infant directed speech um, in, in all of these distinct languages. Now, lastly, for, um, or not lastly yet, but for vowel space area, we see um, that some languages show quite strong effects exaggerating distinctions between vowels, but we also see language specificity. So for Cantonese, Chinese, um, for Danish and for Dutch, we actually see very weak effect sizes indicating that in these languages, caregivers don't exaggerate the differences between the individual vowel categories. And lastly, for articulation rate, we see a lot of blue squares indicating that these are negative effect sizes, and these show quite strong effects across all, all the distinct languages that we can see here. And here, a final visualization of the results. So um, pitch on the left, we see US English up here and US English over here, indicating that these show strong effects in indicating the pitch and pitch variability show quite strong effects for US English. And this relates to the point I had about the bias in terms of um, the languages that, were, that have been investigated for infant directed speech, um, which I'll be happy to take questions on um, afterwards. Great. So we can ask then, well, what have we learned by conducting this meta-analysis? What have we learned by synthesizing the evidence of on infant directed speech? And partly we've learned that, so across space, right, across distinct languages, we have quite strong evidence for these universal tendencies in, in the properties of infant directed speech, in how IDS sounds across languages. So this is the reason why we can identify US English speech as being infant directed or adult directed, right? Because we're all using the same acoustic features to express this speech style. And then we also have across time, um, we see dynamic changes in infant directed speech as the infants grow older, right? So certain properties change and other properties remain stable according to the abilities and needs of the infant. Okay. And what we can conclude from this is that uh, is also that some IDS properties might be language specific, right? So we saw that vowel space area um, showed more language specificity than, for example, pitch or pitch variability or articulation rate. But we can also maybe conclude that caregivers might adjust their speech to scaffold infants' development. So uh, the fact that we see these dynamic changes in terms of the properties of infant directed speech might indicate that caregivers are responding to uh, the needs and abilities of their infants. So as infants become more linguistically mature, they're also um, adopt or adapting their speech style to, to suit those needs. Great.
And I didn't conduct this work alone. So I'd like to say thank you to all of my collaborators um, and supervisors. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, let's have a, a emoji clap of hands, or a real clap of hands. Um, before we move on to questions for Chris, we're going to have uh, a little return to the mentee quiz. Um, so hopefully you kept that window open from before. Um, if not, then you can still join it. So if you go to mentee.com and use that access code at the top of the screen now, so 86095166. Um, and yeah, if you just give us a like to know that you're here and, and ready for the start of, of round two of the quiz. Okay, um, I can see most of you are in. Great. So yeah, so here's some follow-up questions on that topic of infant directed speech. Um, I'm first gonna play you two recordings of IDS and just think about which one you think is to the, the, the younger infant, basically, um, you know, based on the things that we've just learned from Chris's talk there. Um, and these recordings are taken from the classroom materials. So this is a chance to kind of test out the activities that you can run uh, with your own students. Okay, so hopefully the sound will work. Just play this. Oh, try that again. Grapes are just the thing, are they? What, what's good about grapes? Oh, that's angel delight, is it? Oh, that looks lovely. Oh, I see. Why do you have angel delight, then? It's very tasty, thank you. Very lovely. It's pink angel delight. What have you got there? Have you got a tangerine? Which one do you want? Tangerine or ball? You want that one? It's not... No, come on, sweetie. That won't taste... Oh, you've broken it. Yo! Doesn't taste nice, that bit. Tangerine. You want two bits? Here you go. One bit, two bits. No, you've got it all. Here you go. I just realised I have a tangerine as well, which is a product placement there. Um, OK, so you've heard the two recordings. So now the question is which of those um, was to the, the, the younger infant, basically. I remember, the faster you are, the more points you get. Wow, there you go. Proof of these universals. Very good. 23 uh, of the 25 responses. It was not a trick question. They are, well, the, the infants were of different ages. Okay, um, now the same thing. Oh, that's the leaderboard. Not much movement. Interesting. Now let's do the same thing, but with another pair of recordings. So this time recording C and D. Do you want a shaky mouse, or do you want a sort of squeaky horse, <laughs> or belly bear, or the elephant? I'm looking for my teddy bear, please. Is it under the rocking bed? No. <gasps> there it is. Thank you for your help. There. There we are, that's better. And who's she going to share with? This one. Okay, possibly a bit trickier. Um, so the same question, now that you've heard them, which one of those uh, was to the, the younger infant? Recording C or recording D? Or were they the same age? <laughs> ah, as I expected, a bit trickier. 
So eight of you got it right. It was actually recording C, the first one that you heard, which was to the younger infant. Okay, so now, oh yeah, leaderboard. Oh, Spam Mac Spam Face is climbing up there. No, oh, it's all changed. Look at that. We have a new person in the lead as things stand. Well done. Okay, so now um, have a think about, obviously you made that decision, but what were those features that kind of led you to, to pick in recording A, B, C, or D um, as being to the younger infant? What kind of things do you notice in those younger recordings? Okay, so, oh, it's moving too fast. I can't read them. Um, higher pitch, um, intonation, pitch variation. So yeah, that's what Chris was talking about, pitch variability. Um, speed, so we've got an idea of articulation rate, speech rate. It is moving so fast. <laughs> um, what else have we got? loudness yeah so the actual kind of amplitude that how loud the voice is um yeah there you go the joy of word clouds that update live okay um that's all we've got time for for round two um so now there'll be an opportunity for four or five minutes i think um if anyone's got any questions for chris um so i'll hand over to Catherine to share those George. So we've got a few questions sent to us in the chat. Um, if you have any more, then then we've got a few minutes. We've got four minutes, three minutes. So um, we welcome any of the ones you have, and we will um, address them later on if we don't have time now. So the first question we have uh, for Chris is, why do you think US English uses a higher pitch and a greater pitch variability than UK English? Why do we see that variability? Similar languages. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I'm I'm not sure I can answer it. <laughs> um, so we know that there's there is variability in terms of the properties that different languages use, and I think there's just a cultural practice of producing infant directed speech with a higher degree of pitch and pitch variability in, in U.S. English. Um, yeah, uh, if you look at the languages that have been investigated for these uh, features as well. So this is related to the question as well about the bias in terms of the languages that we've had um, for direct speech. And US English is so exaggerated in its acoustic properties that it might actually lead us to have this inflated view of infant directed speech. Because if, if the language that we're investigating so often is so exaggerated in its properties, well, maybe that's not how most languages actually work. Um, so maybe British English is is less exaggerated than US English for that for those reasons. But yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so then we have oh, a question um, about the, the I don't know if you can answer this, Chris, but in the last um, game that we just had in the pub quiz, how close were C and D? How close were they in age? Are you able to say? You remember, if not, that's can. probably more a question for, for George or for Ben. I, yeah, I'm just digging it out now. So I think um, it was 10 months and 32 months. Is that does that sound about right? Yeah. So it, it does say that in the classroom materials where you've got access to the sound files, it does say the age of the infant. So yeah, um, 10 months and, and 32 months. Thank you, George. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are taken from the classroom materials. Um, and then we've got another question um, about the use of baby talk. Uh, sometimes people are concerned about using baby talk for fear that it might that it might somehow inhibit children's language development. But your talk suggests that this isn't the case. So, do you think that caregivers should be concerned about the way they talk to children, um, or is it okay that input is variable to to children? That's a great question. Um... So again, I'm not sure I have the answer, <laughs> but um, I would say the, the tendency for caregivers across so many distinct languages to use similar properties to express infant directed speech sort of suggests that it may, that it serves a function, right? Um, 
if only just to grab infants' attention. It might be that simply that, right? It might not be that it's to do with the actual signal, the speech signal itself, but rather that it um, allows the infant to, or it allows you to grab the infant's attention towards the speech signal, and that that might in turn help them um, with development. Um, so I'm not sure, I mean, there are studies showing that language outcomes do depend on the amount of speech that infants hear, um, and infant-directed speech being a part of that speech um, input, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that you should do one thing or the other as, as a caregiver. <laughs> Right. Oh, sorry. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in now, which I'll um, take a note of um, for um, for us to address on the website. But I think now um, we are going to I'm going to ask um, Julia Colquhoun to take the floor um, and, and share the screen. And in the meantime, if you do have questions about Chris's talk that, that come to you, your mind, please still put them in the chat and we will get back to you. So. Um, I'd like to welcome Yulia now. Um, she is a lecturer in our department and she carries out research in the areas of pragmatics and grammatical variation in English and teaches modules in these areas. Um, I think she's now ready to present her work um, on variation in proper noun modifiers in English. So Yulia, whenever you're ready. Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen. I think that is the case. Yes, super. Okay, so it's really nice to see so many of you here. Um, so I'm Julia Kalkman and my talk today is about so-called proper noun modifiers uh, such as the Obama government and the Wembley Stadium uh, in English. And my talk uh, taps into an area of linguistics called grammatical variation, which according to a standard definition involves two or more ways of saying the same thing. So let me give you an example of what is meant by this. Um, so here in one, we have a short excerpt from a novel which reads as follows. Uh, there was a rather cryptic exchange at the Myers dinner party between him and Hilary Roberts. Rickards crouched forward, his huge hand cradling the whiskey glass. Without looking up, he said, the Meyer dinner party. I reckon that cozy little gathering, if it was cozy, is at the nub of this case. So we can see that um, the two constructions, the Maya's dinner party on the one hand and the Maya dinner party on the other are in variation here because they both mean the same thing in that they both refer to a dinner party hosted by the Mayas, but they look different from a grammatical point of view. So um, the first construction, the Maya's dinner party is what I'll be referring to as proper noun genitives or PN genitives for short. And the second construction, the Maya dinner party, is what I'll be referring to as proper noun modifiers or PN modifiers um, for short. So before we carry on, I'd like to actually do a little poll with you to see um, how solid this alternation is once we look at more examples. So in other words, I'd like us to think about whether PN genitives and PN modifiers always express the same meaning. So Take a moment to read through these two sets of sentences and vote by the poll whether you think Obama's government and the Obama government and Ghana's problem and the Ghana problem mean the same thing. Okay, I can see some answers coming in now. I'm going to give you another 20 seconds or so before I end the poll. It takes a little while to figure out, isn't it? It's not straightforward. Okay, super. So um, I can see that not all of you have had the chance to participate just yet, but in the interest of time, I'm going to have to end the poll at this point. Um, and I'm going to... Uh, share the results as well, which you should be able to see at this point. Um, good, so um, thank you everyone. Um, 
and I'm going to just close the poll now. So it looks like most of you um, agree that Obama's government and the Obama government are equivalent in meaning, whereas Ghana's problem and the Ghana problem are not. And that's correct, because Ghana's problem is a problem incurred by Ghana, whereas the Ghana problem could also be interpreted as a problem that is incurred by another entity, but concerning Ghana. So um, in linguistics, uh, we call these paraphrasing relationships, such as led by or incurred by that we've just talked about, semantic relations, which is a term I'll be using quite a lot in my talk today. So semantic relations, as I use them here, are the relationships which hold between the two nouns, and we call them semantic relations because they're essentially meaning relations in more um, informal terms. Right, so coming back to the question of how solid the alternation between P and genitives and uh, P and modifies is, we've uh, seen that it works in some cases, but not in others, which is basically pure honey for a linguist interested in grammatical variation. And um, so these similarities and differences in uh, the alternation potential between P and genitives and P and modifies then kind of prompted us to dive a bit deeper into their meaning. So um, we were interested uh, in whether semantic relations are the key to this seemingly erratic behavior. In other words, is it the case that PN modifiers like the Ghana problem are better suited to expressing something like the theme relation we see in this noun phrase where Ghana is the theme or, or the topic of the problem, but the problem is actually experienced by uh, another entity. So to answer this question, we specified two more concrete uh, research questions. Uh, first, we wanted to know which semantic relations the two constructions can express full stop. And this was motivated by the fact that um, while there had actually been a lot of uh, research already into P and genitives, we didn't know very much at the time about what kinds of semantic relations P and modifiers could express. And the second thing we wanted to know is which semantic relations they share and which they don't. And in the case of which semantic relations we maintain meaning uh, equivalence. So what did we do? Um, well, we conducted an experimental um, questionnaire based study, which was based on a previous corpus study of proper noun modifiers that we conducted in 2015 where we looked at the kinds of discourse environments that um, these kinds of modifiers were found in. Um, and that was just to get a first overview of how they pattern and what meanings they can express. And I'll say a bit more about the corpus aspect um, of our study shortly, but uh, for now, we ended up with a total of 109 native speakers of English. So a really good amount of data in the end, which I remember took us a very long time to analyze. Um, let me also say a few words about the data we used in the actual um, experimental study. So remember that we wanted to look at um, the alternation potential between P and modifiers and P and genitives. And as is normal in studies of grammatical variation, we couldn't just include any noun phrase that looked like a P and modifier, but had to actually restrict ourselves um, amongst other things to those indefinite noun phrases. So that's because proper noun genitives are by definition definite. So you wouldn't get variation between something like a London museum and London's museum, for example. And I hope you all agree on that. Um, we also went for P and modifiers with an identifying function only because they share this with P and genitives again. And this simply means that a, a noun phrase like the London museum uh, or London's museum picks out or identifies a specific salient entity. So we excluded uh, PN modifiers with a um, so-called classifying function such as Yorkshire Terrier, which wouldn't paraphrase as Yorkshire Terrier, and also those with a descriptive function um, such as Mona Lisa Smile, which wouldn't paraphrase as Mona Lisa Smile when used with this function. Okay, so before I say exactly what we asked our participants to do in this study, let me show you the kinds of sentences we had them uh, look at. So in total, we used uh, 20 sentences, um, all of which we took from the British National Corpus. Um, and a lot of studies in the area of grammatical variation actually use made up examples, but we weren't interested in sort of alternation possibilities in the abstract, but we wanted to probe actual language use. And so some of these um, examples allowed only the P and genitive construction. Um, and here is an example that you can um, have a look at. And some allowed only the P and modifier construction. And again, here is another example um, to support that. Um, and the rest then allowed both. Um, so I'm not going to read these out now due to time constraints, but you can check this um, for yourself later um, if you're interested.
Um, okay, so right, what did we actually um, ask participants to do? Well, um, we asked them to read the following sentence and indicate how naturally they thought each of the phrases would fill the indicate, indicated gap on a ranking between one and 10. And if they thought um, both were equally natural, they could give them the same score. So this sentence here is one of the examples from the corpus, but we blanked out the um, construction that was actually used and got participants then to rate how natural the PN genitive or the PN modifier respectively sounded here. And if participants rated one or both of the constructions above three, we asked them to paraphrase them on the next screen, um, which we'll look at now. So here, um, most of the participants chose the PN genitive Northern Ireland's experience and were then asked to express the relationship between um, experience and Northern Ireland using um, this template below. And here we were, of course, interested um, in semantic relations, uh, which I'll um, come to now. So, um, well, what did we then have to do actually as researchers once we, we got all of these responses from our participants? Well, um, we had to essentially uh, code the different paraphrases that were given to us. Um, and you can imagine um, how many we had to deal with, given that we had 20 examples and 109 participants. Um, so what we did, and, and this is what I mean by code, um, was to group the different paraphrases uh, into seven major uh, semantic relations. Um, and I'm just going to detail one of them now to save time. So for the sentence containing the PN genitive, Edward's affair, for example, uh, participants use paraphrases like the affair that Edward committed uh, or the affair that was carried out by Edward. And we group those into the semantic relation actor because there is an element of um, Edward doing something or, or acting on something here. And um, the others, as you can see here, are called undergoer, possessor, location, name, involvement and um, beneficiary. Okay, so this is then what we did uh, in terms of sort of how we how we dealt with all the different responses we got. Um, and I would now like to look at our hypotheses and results. So um, the first hypothesis we came up with was about possible semantic relations. Um, and based on the corpus study, um, we hypothesized that only the PN modifier construction could convey the name relation as in um, the Subway sandwich shop, which could be paraphrased as something like the sandwich shop that is called Subway or whatever. Um, so we didn't actually find a single P and genitive in the corpus study which conveyed this relation, uh, hence this hypothesis. Um, for the actor relation, we found in the corpus study that this um, exclusively clustered with the PN genitive construction, as in Glasgow's move, uh, the move that was made by Glasgow, for example. Uh, the location and involvement relations, on the other hand, were only found with the PN modifier construction, as in the California desert, the desert that is located in California, um, and the Kobe Bryant case, the case that involves Kobe Bryant. Um, and we'd also actually use the involvement relation for our previous um, example, the Ghana problem, by the way. So if it's true that this is limited to the PN modifier construction, that could then potentially explain why the PN genitive variant Ghana's problem isn't a good paraphrase. So that was sort of our, our reasoning behind this. Um, what did we find? Well, Firstly, that the PN genitive construction can also convey name, as in the Kobe Bryant case, where some participants ranked Kobe Bryant's case as a natural filler and paraphrased it as the case that is named after Kobe Bryant. Um, we also found, contrary to expectations, that the involvement interpretation wasn't limited to the PN modifier construction, but was also chosen uh, for the PN genitive construction. So some participants um, paraphrased Kobe Bryant's case as the case that involved or was about Kobe Bryant. And sometimes um, this was even paraphrased using the actor relation, as in the case that Kobe Bryant led, um, but that was probably due to limited background knowledge, which I'll say something more about in a moment. So generally speaking, the first um, hypothesis wasn't supported by our data. Okay, the second hypothesis um, we came up with concerns the alternation potential between PN genitives and PN modifiers. Uh, and we anticipated that, for example, falling into the PN genitive only and PN modifier only groups, so those where no alternation was possible, 
participants would naturally rate one of the two constructions very high and the other much lower. And in the third group where alternation is possible, we anticipated that participants would rate both constructions uh, similarly. The results were again not as we'd hypothesized. Um, there was a bit of a continuum in each set of examples and um, the ratings differed somewhat from example to example. Uh, I won't go into the details of this as I don't really have much time, but the actual ratings um, can be found in a, in a nice big table, um, which is actually easy to read. Uh, that's the good news um, in, in the paper um, for those of you who are interested. Um, more generally uh, though, um, the P and genitive only examples showed a larger difference between the ratings for the PN genitive and the uh, PN modifier and a lower rating for the undesired option than the PN modifier only cases. And we put this down to the fact that participants perhaps have a better grasp of the PN genitive construction as it's used more frequently uh, than the PN modifier construction and so can maybe differentiate uh, its meaning more clearly from that of an equivalent PN modifier. But that's just sort of, you know, us thinking about the, the reason for this and, and we weren't entirely sure actually um, what this was all about. Um, okay. So before I summarize, uh, I wanted to show you some unexpected results, starting with a couple of examples where alternation was in principle possible. So for the California desert versus California's desert, um, participants somehow preferred the California desert. Um, and we put that down to the different paraphrases assigned to each variant, uh, namely is in California for the PN modifier variant, which is a location reading um, and belongs to California for the PN genitive variant which is a possessor reading. And what's really interesting, I think, to note here is that the semantic uh, relations assigned to each noun phrase appear to be completely context dependent and not uniform across uh, participants. And this is something I'll come back to again at the end of the talk. Um, and, and really quite similarly, participants preferred Thatcher's government over the Thatcher government. And we saw many actor type paraphrases here, such as belong to Thatcher and was led by Thatcher which um, we'll see actually more preferentially associated with the PN genitive construction. Um, okay, so for the um, PN genitive only and PN modifier only cases, we sometimes found that participants use the unexpected variant uh, due to lack of context and background knowledge. You know, to give just one example, um, in nine here, we were expecting participants to pick the PN modifier variant, the Kashmir problem, rather than the PN genitive variant, Kashmir's problem. But in actual fact, a lot of participants did pick the PN genitive variant uh, and paraphrase it as the problem that was incurred by Kashmir, not realizing that the Kashmir problem is actually one that revolves around Kashmir. So in a way, I think using actual corpus examples turned out to be a, a disadvantage in cases like this because we didn't give enough context uh, and just relied on participants having the, the relevant background knowledge. Um, okay, so to come back to our first uh, research question, um, we found that in principle, all seven relations can be expressed by both constructions with none actually being restricted to either construction. Um, so it's not the case that the two constructions are associated with a particular finite set of semantic relations. Um, and I'll say more about this in a moment. So in terms of um, what semantic relations are shared between the two constructions, um, given the first finding, it's clear that generally all of them are shared. Um, but we did find a number of preferred associations between certain relations and either of the two constructions. So um, as you can see here in, in this diagram, um, possessor and actor cluster more closely with the P and genitive um, and name uh, clusters more closely with the P and modifier. And then there are various relations sort of somewhere in the middle, like beneficiary and undergoer and location um, and involvement. Good, so what are some of the take home messages from the study? Uh, well, first off, I think the term semantic relations is actually a bit of a misnomer um, because these kind of uh, paraphrasing relations are not part of the lexis of the constructions but have to be worked out on a case by case basis. So they should be more aptly called pragmatic relations. And we saw this in numerous examples, um, right? Where participants gave slightly different interpretations of one and the same noun phrase. So we can actually say that both constructions are to some extent underspecified from the point of view of their meaning and they kind of have to be worked out um, in context or pragmatically in actual sort of language use. 
And um, an interesting consequence of this is that semantic relations alone can't really account for the variation between PN genitives and PN modifiers, because neither construction, as we said, comes for the predefined set of expressible meanings. So yes, there may be default associations, but uh, they're crucially not absolute. And we really need to also look to other factors in order uh, to be able to predict which of the two constructions is chosen in which context. So these may include genre. Um, so it's common for PN modifiers to be used in newspaper headlines, for example, um, as well as formality. So um, Quite interestingly, we had some comments from participants saying that they thought the PN modifier sounded more formal than the PN genitive, for example. And the extension task that, that our colleague Ben has prepared for this talk will actually get you to think a bit about these kinds of considerations. Okay, so I'll end here uh, and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Ilya. Okay, let me um, yeah, so we'll have time for questions. Before then, um, we of course have the quiz. So I will share my screen again. And if you can return to the, the Menti website, um, if you've closed it, I think it should still remember your score. So you've not lost out if you've closed it and reopened it. Um, so a reminder, the code is 8609-5166. Um, and if you can just press the like button so that we know you're in there, ready and waiting. Okay, so I think we're going to start off with um, a couple of questions that don't have right or wrong answers. So um, it won't affect the leaderboard in any way, but it's a chance to reflect on some of the things that we've just uh, heard about. Okay, let's get started. So fill in this headline with the most natural option to you. So what blank tells us about misogyny in Westminster? So the options are the Angela Rayner story, Angela Rayner's story, um, or, you know, if both options are equally natural to you, then you can pick that uh, as well. Um, I'm going to fill this in as, as I wait. Okay, so there's some variation. I mean, there's, there's a clear um, preference for what the Angela Rayner story tells us about misogyny in Westminster. But some of you have said they're equally okay. And some of you have also said that Angela Rayner's story um, is, is the more natural option. Interesting. Okay, so now based on that, so thinking about, you know, for those of you who at least had a preference, um, how would you describe the difference in meaning between those two headlines? Okay, so what the Angela Rayner story tells us about misogyny in Westminster versus what Angela Rayner's story. So if you think they kind of mean different things, um, then there's a chance for you to type that in uh, and submit. You've only got 250 characters, so you have to keep it concise. Okay, so it makes the first option more specific. Uh, it's about a particular episode, not her whole life. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, Angela Rayner's story of her life. Um, B sounds more personal. Two of you have said that. There's a wider issue rather than just her own experience. It's part of a fuller narrative. A suggests a, di a discrete incident, whereas B suggests her entire career. Yes, that's a similar kind of sentiment to what we just saw. Okay, interesting thoughts. Um, can I scroll down and view them all? No, it's not letting me. I apologize to whoever put this one, which is... Oh, wait, here we go. There we go. The Angela story sounds like a fixed tale that we can learn from. So quite a lot of variety in terms of, you know, how you interpret those, which is quite interesting. Okay, let's get to um, the questions that really mean something now, the questions that are worth points. Um, so question six of eight, remember, there is a speed element here. So what is the semantic relation between Sainsbury and family in the construction, the Sainsbury family? The actor, beneficiary, location, name, possessor, or undergoer.
The correct answer was name. And well done to the six of you who got it right. Let's see what that's done to the leaderboard. There you go. There's one round left, so don't worry. If you're not quite in the top three yet, there's a chance to redeem yourself. Uh, but for now, I will stop sharing and we can take any questions for Julia. Thank you, George. So yeah, we have um, five more minutes, five minutes left for questions for Julia. Um, and I can see that we've already, already got one in the chat from Rebecca. Um, I'd be interested to know what people would do with the phrase Tory cuts. Would that be acceptable to have the PN genitive and the PN modifier version? A quick Google shirt search shows both being used. Julia, can you say something? Yeah, good question. You kind of start to, to wonder, don't you, about these constructions, whether they can be used uh, with the equivalent, uh, uh, with, with, with the other equivalent. Um, yeah, I'd say so. So Tory cuts sounds to me as though you could also easily say Tories, the Tories cuts. So the Tory cuts have been devastating or the Tories cuts have been devastating, both sound fine to me. And yes, you make a good point, Rebecca, when you say that the Google, the, when you do a Google search, you can actually see both um, being used. There is this thing called Google fight. So if you're ever not sure whether one, one construction is better than the other, go to Google fight and, and let it show you what the sort of preferences are. And you will see sometimes that one construction is used more than the other. Uh, and vice versa. And so this is really interesting and it's a nice little tool that I think you can easily, could easily use with your students as well, actually. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Google Ngrams, Sam, that's right. That is a bit more complicated, I think, than Google Fight. But yes, if you wanted to do this more in depth, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, uh, did any participants in, indicate some degree of uncertainty in their answers, for example, suggesting multiple paraphrases, or were they pretty certain about their answers and always choose one specific interpretation? Yeah, another really good question. So absolutely, uh, the one um, category, which I won't call a semantic relation, um, because it's not a semantic relation, but one category that we actually also came up with is the, the don't know category, because Sometimes participants would give paraphrases that actually we didn't really know how to slot into any of these seven major semantic relations that we came up with. And so for those, we then just ended up with the don't know category. It was pretty rare, but we did uh, definitely get those as well. Yeah. And in the case of multiple um, relations, um, we tended, as far as memory serves, to go with the first relation that was indicated in the answer but again that was pretty rare some uh, answers uh, we had to discard altogether because they just weren't useful in any way and participants are kind of misunderstood what they were supposed to do um, but yeah most of the the responses were actually pretty pretty solid and I think the template that we gave helped because participants couldn't go rogue when when it came to actually pa uh, providing these paraphrases <laughs> And actually, that takes me on nicely to the next question. Um, how did you decide on the semantic relation categories? And is there a limited number of them? Yeah, so um, in the linguistics literature, there's actually a fair few um, established taxonomies of semantic relations. So um, if, if you basically also just look at um, a, a grammar of the English language and a more linguistically oriented one, especially, you will often find that for the genitive, a certain number of, um, of semantic relations is specified. And the idea is basically that this is a finite set that can be expressed. Uh, and there are no relations that can be expressed beyond that. But actually, um, I've always found that to be really tricky. And actually, I spent three and a half years during my PhD arguing that you can't do it like that. And you have to stipulate a much more open meaning, which is then figured out in context. But so how did we decide on our relations? Well, we were just simply led by the data. We, we took a completely data-driven approach. And so we didn't 
sort of from the get-go specify what semantic relations there would be, but we simply came up with a list of these relations on the basis of the kind of major part uh, major responses and, and paraphrases that we were given by participants and then we check those semantic relations against um, sort of more commonly established taxonomies in the literature and we actually found that there was quite a bit of overlap um, but we also came up with semantic relations that hadn't really previously been um, appreciated for the for the genitive especially which is of course the construction that's been around for absolutely ages and and, and a lot of people think that they know everything about but turns out when you really look into the meaning of the genitive construction um, there is a lot more going on than first meets the eye. Great, thank you very much. We are out of time and um, there's a couple of questions that we have not yet answered so please do let um, please do keep asking questions and as I say before we will continue to answer them um, and Sam just posted in the chat that we have a video explainer on how to use Google Ngram so you can you can check that out on the York Toolkit website. Um, so thank you very much, Julia, um, and I'll now hand over to Claire. Hi, thanks, Catherine. Um, so we're at the point in the programme where we have a, a short break um, for five minutes. So um, if you want to get a comfort break or a cup of tea or something, feel free. Uh, and we'll come back uh, for Reese's talk at 3.45. Um, but in the meantime, if you're hanging around, we wanted to let you know about uh, an opportunity for, for some more English language content uh, that might interest you, um, which is a massive online open course, shortened to MOOC, um, as they're called, um, which is called Accents, Attitudes and Identity and Introduction to Sociolinguistics. And this is a course um, created by members of staff in the department um, and I'll just share the screen so you can see where to get the information on this and talk a little bit about it. So um, you've probably seen this page before and um, this is the CBD workshop page for today. Um, you can see the web address there, but it's on uh, on the emails and, and slides and things like that as well. And um, if you scroll right down to the bottom, uh, you'll see a, a link to the MOOC here and how to sign up um, so it's a free four week online course when you sign up you get six weeks access to it so you don't have to necessarily finish it in the four weeks um, you can start at any point um, but we're, we're talking about it today because we're starting a new facilitation window which means basically um, myself and a couple of our colleagues and, and students in the department are going to be um, facilitating the course, which means we answer your questions and comments um, and just hang about in, in the in the comments uh, as you go through the course. Um, so uh, if you click um, this link, it will take you to the page that gives you a bit more information. Um, and this is the link to sign up to it. Uh, and what I'll do now is play this very short one minute video, which introduces you to the course and you'll see our colleague Don Watt in here explaining about the course and he's one of the facilitators that you'll see uh, if you joined us from Monday as well. Have you ever been mistaken for being from somewhere you're not based on your voice? Or have you ever tried to put on an accent, successfully or not? Was this in order to tell a more compelling story, have a laugh? or perhaps it was an attempt to try and fit in with a particular community. These sorts of situations show that our accents play a crucial role in how we perform our identity, as well as how we're perceived by others. Many aspects of our identity, from where we grew up to our cultural background or our sexuality, can be expressed and perceived through our speech. The connection between our voices and who we are has long been a focus of study for sociolinguists. Together in this four-week course, we'll explore different accents, people's attitudes towards them, and how accents relate to the expression of identity. I very much hope you can join us. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a taste there. And um, if you want to have a look at the kinds of things that are covered in the course, you can also see some free MOOC taster lessons, uh, this link on the right hand side. These are permanently available, so you don't even need to register for them. And you're welcome to use them in your teaching with students. Um, the, we picked out um, a number of case studies. So there's 
um, some work on accent bias Britain that Dom's involved in, um, multicultural London English with work by Paul Kurzweil and colleagues, um, some you know sessions on salience accommodation. Um, so you can have a look through those and, and if you like what you see, uh, then you might be interested in the course. Um, your students also might like to enroll and we also have a link here to UCAS related offers and basically if, if um, students complete the course and can show that they've engaged with it, they can apply for a reduced offer for our undergraduate um, uh, programs in our department. Um, so you can find more information on that in the link there. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop sharing. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Reese, who's our next speaker for today. So um, Reese is working in sociolinguistics, so um, ties in nicely to some of the topics that we cover on the MOOC. Um, Reese is an associate lecturer in the department who researches and teaches in the field of sociolinguistics. Um, he's particularly interested in lexical variation and what this can tell us about style shifting and people's sense of identity. Uh, and Reese is going to now present his work on inverted style shifting in Anglo Cornish dialect Lexus. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, so, as Claire's just said, my name is Reese Sando uh, and I'm a lecturer in social linguistics in the department. So, I'm going to be talking to you over the next 20 minutes or so uh, on a talk entitled Language Diversity Inverted Style Shifting in Anglo Cornish Dialect Lexis. So, let's just break down that title a little bit. So firstly, we're thinking about language diversity. Now, we're thinking specifically about uh, sort of diversity within language. So we're focusing just on the English language at the moment here. We're thinking about production of uh, linguistic usage, so the way in which people actually use language, but also diversity in the way that people perceive it or attitudes that people may have towards language and language variation. Now, the main focus of the talk today is going to be on the way that individual speakers can vary in their use of language in different contexts. And this is what's meant by style shifting in the title. But what I'm going to be talking about is a particular finding in my uh, PhD research, which I completed a couple of years ago, which is uh, essentially the, the exact opposite of, of what's typically taught in sociolinguistic textbooks and uh, what is typically thought about the way in which style shifting happens. And I'm, I'm working on a particular variety of English that is Anglo Cornish. So that's the variety of English spoken in Cornwall. And I'm focusing, as, as Claire said, on vocabulary. So that's lexical variation. So let's start off just with some background. Uh, so what we know about language variation and change. Uh, what we know is that it's it's a very natural feature of, of healthy languages, right? So something that uh, occurs in any language variety that we may wish to observe. And we also know that variation can be caused by a number of different factors. So these factors could be language internal. So it could be something to do with, uh, for example, the, the type of sentence that uh, a feature occurs in. So is it in a uh, declarative sentence or an interrogative sentence? We can also think about social factors, which we'll be doing a little bit today. So things like social class, gender, age, um, and also the, the primary focus of today's talk, which is on stylistic variation. So as I mentioned earlier, variation within the same individual in different contexts. So starting off by thinking about social factors. So we know that language varies according to geography. This is one of the things that we've known about uh, sort of for the longest time, thinking back to uh, dialectology studies back to the 19th century, for example. What we've got here is a, a, a figure which demonstrates the changing use of uh, what's called roticity. So this is the way in which people pronounce the word like arm. Do they say arm or arm? Now in the 1950s, what we can see here, and this is data collected from the survey of English dialects, we get a much higher proportion of roticity, particularly in the, the south, uh, southwest, but also in pockets uh, sort of in the northwest and northeast as well. But in 2016, this has uh, certainly become less common. So, so this is language change that we've got here over this sort of 60, 65 year time period. But what we know is that not everybody within the same community speaks in the same way. So you know, we can unpack this sort of geographical data in a number of different ways. 
So one of the things we might want to do is consider uh, other social factors other than region. So social class, gender, age, uh, and also regional identity, which I'll be talking a little bit about today. And what we know is that these processes of linguistic change are mediated by these uh, social factors. So some groups may be more advanced in a change and others may be slightly more conservative. So thinking about stylistic variation, and we've just spoken about social variation. So one of the general um, sort of principles uh, that we that we know to be true in, in sociolinguistic studies is that there are no single style speakers. So what this essentially means is that there are no people who speak in the same way all of the time. We all vary the way that we speak uh, according to a number of different factors. And one of the most studied um, aspects of this variation is something known as attention to speech. And what essentially this means is that we, we vary the way that we speak depending on uh, how much sort of focus we have on the, the language that we're producing. So typically the finding which is um, attested in, in various sociolinguistic studies and is discussed in, in all sociolinguistic textbooks is that what happens as we pay more and more attention to our speech is that we start using fewer and fewer uh, examples of non-standard variants. So here, we have a, a figure which demonstrates the pronunciation of uh, ing at the end of words. So um, it's comparing pronunciation like running with a pronunciation like running. And what this figure shows is that as people pay more attention to their speech, um, moving into careful speech styles, and then even more careful speech, which is a, a, a red passage of text, they reduce the, the extent to which they use that running pronunciation and therefore increase. Their, um, the amount of times they use the running pronunciation. So this is typically what we know about um, attention to speech and the way that people vary their speech according to attentional load. Uh, there are also other ways of thinking about stylistic variation, such as accommodation theory that we won't have time to go into today. Um, so one of the things that I want to talk about in addition to uh, the purely quantitative patterns of language variation that we observe is the way that people perceive language. Now, one of the uh, sort of most widely talked about um, ways of perceiving language can be described as uh, something known as a standard language ideology, which is defined by Lippy Green uh, here, which I won't read out in its entirety. But essentially, this uh, quote says that the, the, the speech used by the upper middle class and which is legitimized by um, dominant institutions of the state tends to be the, the variety that people perceive to be um, correct or they perceive to be better than other alternative, maybe non-standard ways of speaking. Um, so in the context of England, what this often means is that standard Southern British English is often perceived to be correct or better than other uh, particularly regional varieties uh, and I think this attitude can account for a great deal of stylistic variation so we've seen uh, from previous examples the way that that people shift towards the standard in in careful speech styles so in in their view maybe they're they're talking in a way that's more correct or better uh, when they're really focusing on the way that they're using language um, so I think it's also really important to think about um, the way that, that people perceive a range of different uh, accent varieties. Now, I'm not going to talk a huge amount about this figure here, but if you if you do want to know more about it, uh, Don Watt talks about it in his um, toolkit presentation talk from a couple of years ago. So that's available on the website if you do want to know more. The thing that I really want to, to focus on here is is the is the second um, label here, which is essentially when people uh, are asked to evaluate their own accent or, or the accent of their local community, they tend to, to evaluate it really highly, quite positively. Um, you know, only RP here is evaluated more positively. And what this really shows is that people do have quite a strong sense of accent loyalty. So whereby other communities sort of looking, um, looking at an accent may perceive it in, in various negative terms, actually people have very um, strong positive feelings towards their own accent. And that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, so 
I've mentioned a little bit about the way that people use language already today, and then I've also mentioned a bit about some of the ways in which people perceive language. Now, I don't think these two uh, factors are independent. I think they're two, two sides of the same coin. Um, so only by understanding uh, both production and perception can we really understand uh, sociolinguistic variation in terms of the, the pure quantitative distributions, but also in terms of our understanding of, of why we get the kinds of sociolinguistic patterns uh, that we do. So for my research, the key question I'm interested in answering is, is what patterns of stylistic variation emerge when a community largely doesn't conform to this standard language ideology? So we've seen what happens when a community largely does conform to this standard language ideology, whereby people shift towards this standard variety in more careful speech. But what about when they don't conform to this standard language ideology? So the study that I conducted. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, as I said at the beginning of this talk, lexical variation in the Anglo-Cornish dialect. Um, the study that I talk about here it involves interviews conducted by me with 80 speakers from Cornwall, uh, and this sample of speakers was balanced for age, gender, and social class. And I also used an identity questionnaire to explore and to quantify participant strength of Cornish identity. And I'll show you this questionnaire in a moment. Uh, and I discussed data today from four variables. Just I consider them sort of in the aggregate. I don't. Um, consider them individually in, in this talk. Uh, so the variables that I investigate are, um, so we've got woman uh, and in the Anglo-Cornish dialect alongside a range of sort of pan-English alternatives, we have the word maid, which is found uh, in, in many dialects in the southwest of England. Uh, we have lunchbox, which in the Anglo-Cornish dialect can be lexicalized as either crib box or kraus tin. Uh, we have walk, which can be lexicalized as stank. Uh, and we also have tourist, which can be lexicalized as emit. So these are the four variables that I'm interested in today. Uh, so just a little bit of background about the context in which the research was conducted. So Cornwall. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware that Cornwall is situated at the uh, extreme southwest of Great Britain. So it's there on a map. Uh, and specifically, the research was conducted in uh, two towns in Cornwall, which are Camborne and Redruth, which are circled on the, on the map that you see there. And, and I'm from Redruth, which is important to know uh, in the context of the data collection here. So I'm sort of an in-group member of the community in which uh, I collected the data. So Cornwall traditionally is known for its mining uh, exploits, particularly copper and tin. And here you see an example of uh, tin miners from the Camborne and Redruth area. However, the, the mining industry declined really from the end of the 19th century and the last mine in Cornwall closed in the late 1990s. So in recent years, uh, rather than being known for mining, it's become more and more known as a tourist destination and it's become more and more reliant on uh, the money of tourists uh, for its economy. Uh, Cornwall is also known for its sense of local pride and specifically this local pride uh, can manifest in a number of people as sort of an anti-Englishness or some kind of opposition to England and Englishness. Um, and this is reflected in this graffiti that I saw uh, while I was conducting my fieldwork in Madrid. Uh, so you see here that it, that it says free Cornwall. And essentially this is a, is, uh, a reference to, to Cornish nationalism and a desire to be free of uh, the perceived shackles of, of Westminster. Now, the word below it, you may not be familiar with. Uh, the word below it is Angove. And this is a reference to Michael Angove, who led a rebellion in 1497 uh, against the king who was attempting to raise taxes in order to levy um, the funds for a war against Scotland. And uh, Michael Angove, alongside many other people, said that, you know, this isn't my war. Uh, I'm not interested in, in your dispute with Scotland. We're, we're a separate entity down here in Cornwall. Uh, we don't want to be paying for, for this war. Uh, and Michael Ango and, and many others marched to London to protest uh, about this. Unfortunately, he uh, ended up being executed and, and sort of martyred uh, as uh, this figurehead of this sort of Cornish resistance movement, which we still see um, today in this graffiti. 
So I mentioned earlier that uh, I conducted uh, an identity questionnaire as part of this study. And essentially what this involves is 10 statements and participants are asked the extent to which they agree with these statements. Um, some of the statements are um, directly and explicitly linked to Cornish identity. So things like, I'm proud to be Cornish and uh, I wouldn't want to be from anywhere else. Uh, we also think a little bit about um, the way that people um, react in terms of voting patterns. So statement three here relates to parliamentary candidates and whether or not uh, people be more likely to vote for someone who is who is from their local area uh, to be their MP. But we also uh, have a question relating to uh, a performer, performer on a talent show. So we see sort of very formal and then a more informal context of these sort of voting patterns. Uh, and this was used as a proxy for strength of local identity. Uh, so this was, the responses were quantified um, people with a high score were contrasted with people with a lower score. And I was interested to see whether or not that had an effect on um, linguistic variation as well. So data collection, how did I collect data? Um, so I mentioned earlier that I'm interested in stylistic variation uh, and particularly attention-based um, stylistic variation. So a casual style of speech was elicited from spot the difference tasks, such as this one. So the idea here is that participants are uh, engaged in completing this task, their, their, their attention, their focus is on uh, spotting the differences. Yet in doing so, they need to um, lexicalize or, or, or name the concepts that I'm interested in. So for example, I'm interested in the concept of lunchbox. Uh, and we see here between the frame on the left and the frame on the right, that the lunchbox is uh, turned slightly in its position. So in order to complete this task, participants need to say something like, uh, the lunchbox in a different position, or they may use the local variant, the crib box is in a different position. So here, the idea is that this is a relatively casual style of speech where participants' attention isn't particularly focused on their language use. Uh, this contrasts with a naming task where participants are told, right now I'm really interested in the words that you're using, um, and all they have to do is complete a, a very simple carrier phrase. So this is a lunchbox or or crib box. So the idea here is that there's a contrast in terms of attention to speech between the casual sort of difference task and the careful naming task here. So the results, um, so I'm starting off by talking about the results in terms of the social variation. Um, so the, the key findings are that age and strength of Cornish identity were very strong predictors of the usage of these Anglo-Cornish words that I'm investigating. So what we see in this figure here is the social variables that I'm interested in. So age, identity, class, and gender. And then we also have mean number of Anglo-Cornish words used by uh, people in these categories. Um, so as I mentioned, age and identity were the two factors which were statistically significant. So we can see that people under the age of 30 use an average 0.4 local dialect words, whereas those over the age of 40 used uh, on average 1.15 Cornish dialect words. So you can see this is a big difference. Uh, this also applies to the strength of Cornish identity, where those who have a strong sense of local identity or a high identity questionnaire score averaged 1.2 local dialect words, as opposed to 0 0.22 for those with a less strong sense of local identity. Uh, so yeah, older speakers and those with strong local identities were more likely to use Cornish dialect words. But gender and socioeconomic class um, did not have any statistically significant effects here, even though you know, there, is, there is differences there, but they weren't significant. So in terms of stylistic variation, we see a great deal of stylistic variation. So um, I've just realized that this figure is the wrong way around. Uh, so the labels for careful and casual style should be the other way around, um, which would tell you that actually the local dialect words were much more common in careful speech, not in casual speech, as would be predicted by sociolinguistic theory or by the sort of sociolinguistic textbooks we might read. So what we get here is an inverted pattern of stylistic variation whereby um, the local dialect words are way more common in careful speech which is an inverted style pattern, as I said. So the opposite pattern to the one we might predict. Um, and this pattern isn't specific to, to my study or to vocabulary. Uh, it's been attested 
um, in a number of recent studies in Cornwall. Um, so by Holly Dan on the way that people in Cornwall pronounce the Bath vowel uh, and also roticity. So uh, the kind of example we saw earlier in arm versus arm. So why do we get this inverted pattern in Cornwall? Um, so I account for, for this pattern uh, by introducing a slightly different way of thinking about attention based stylistic variation. And I introduce um, an attention to self model of style. And the idea here is that this model doesn't just consider uh, language in isolation. It doesn't just consider people using language they may perceive to be correct or, or incorrect, but it's about a much broader system of identity construction. Um, and in the context of, of Cornwall, people are constructing um, Cornish identities because for them, sounding Cornish is much more important than sounding either educated or, or sounding posh or, or various other social meanings we might attach to the standard language. Um, and what I argue is that when people are paying greater attention to their language use, they, they're also paying greater attention to the social identities that they are either constructing in, in, a, in a context or if they're reflecting uh, those identities possibly as well. Um, and what I argue is that speakers who, who have a very strong sense of local identity, it's, it's these individuals really who are projecting these local identities um, by using local words in careful speech styles. What's also important to recognize is that identities are, are very much patchwork, right? We don't just have one identity that we align with, but there are multiple identities that we align with, any of which at any particular time. Um, we may wish to perform or stylize or, or construct. And in the context of these social linguistic interviews uh, with, with me, who, who is a, a, a local person and that all participants knew that, it's the, the Cornish identity that, that may be uh, the most meaningful in, in that particular interaction. And therefore we get these local dialect words um, being used to stylize these Cornish identities. So um, I also want to, to take a moment to think about what the participants had to say. So I engage with these participants in uh, discussions about the Cornish dialect and, and when and how it's used and who it's used by, et cetera. Um, and, and they very much, uh, their, their interpretations of how it's used were very much consistent with the quantitative data that I collected. So they said things such as the Anglo-Cornish dialect is reflective of a Cornish identity. It's an identity statement. People use the word Emmet to advertise their Cornishness. Uh, using the word made accentuates your Cornishness. Emmet is a word uh, that is being used more and more as a flag of Cornishness. Uh, and Anglo-Cornish dialect words are becoming the badge of a Cornishman. And people use uh, the Cornish dialect to advertise uh, their Cornishness as a sort of Cornish badge of honor. So the, the findings from this study were very much consistent with the participants' experiences of the Anglo-Cornish dialect in, in the real world. Um, so one question you may have is, well, if, if these people really want to stylize these Cornish identities, why aren't they doing it all the time? Why don't they just use Cornish dialect words all of the time? Clearly they're not uh, doing it all the time because in, in casual speech, they were using um, very, very limited numbers of Cornish dialect words. One of these, one of the key reasons uh, that I argue contributes to this uh, pattern is that people are very much aware that there is a stigma uh, attached to the Cornish dialect, which is held by, by many people. Uh, so in, in general day-to-day -day interactions, they may want to, to avoid using uh, particular words or pronunciations that they fear may lead to some kind of stigma. Uh, another factor is due to simple intelligibility. So there are, there's a high number of uh, in-migrants to Cornwall, particularly from the southeast of England, uh, now, these dialect words are going to be unintelligible to, to these people. People from London and Southeast aren't going to understand these local dialect words, and therefore they may, um, over time, stop using them because it's, it's not conducive to a sort of successful interaction. But in particular contexts, with, with me as a Cornish interviewer, uh, where they know that Cornishness is going to be positively evaluated, uh, they are then keen to, to uh, communicate the Cornishness these, of these Cornish dialect words. Um, so just to, to finish up really, we've got some discussion. Uh, I argue that style, uh, contrary to, to what uh, many other scholars have argued in the past, isn't situated on a single continuum, but it's something that's much more dynamic. Uh, there are a number of different ways in which we can style shift, um, even in the context of 
uh, shifting levels of attention, depending on which identity we want to stylize in a particular context. I've also mentioned that identity isn't um, something monolithic. It's definitely multidimensional and patchwork, and, and we can pick and choose uh, as and when we, we stylize particular types of our identities. Um, and I argue the speakers are more likely to stylize uh, desirable identities when their attention to self is elevated. And for, for some speakers, in my study at least, uh, being Cornish was more important than being perceived to be either educated or posh or the other social meanings we might attach to the standard language. Um, the style pattern that we get here is a consequence of opposing forces of stigma attached to, to the local variety um, by many people, but also this sort of locally meaningful prestige that we also attach to it. So finally, we've got a couple of takeaways. Um, so language attitudes and ideologies are very much tied to linguistic usage. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that I consider these to be sort of two sides of the same coin, attitude and usage. So uh, speakers who sort of subvert this standard language ideology are, are those speakers who are more likely to exhibit this inverted pattern of stylistic variation. And then lastly, and I think this is one of the fundamental uh, things that we can learn from, from sociolinguistics is that language variation can tell us stories about who we are and who we want to be. And I think this uh, study here illustrates that quite nicely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I very much welcome uh, any questions. Okay, thanks, Reeves. A virtual round of applause. Um, and we'll quickly jump to the final round of the quiz. Um, so if you can all join again in the usual way, you go to menti.com and use the access code and yeah, drop us a like when you're in there. So I know you're ready and waiting for the final round. Um, we're actually running a bit over, so I'm going to jump straight into it. Okay, so the first question um, is actually kind of reflected on this idea of you know using an identity questionnaire itself. So what kind of questions do you think you could ask in a survey or in a, in a questionnaire to gauge that strength of someone's local identity? Um, so the example that um, you might see on your phone screen if you're uh, showing the quiz is, you know, do you like where you're from, for example? So have a think about what other questions you could ask to kind of get at this idea of the strength of someone's local identity. Okay, so where do you call home? How involved do you feel in your local community? Yes, very interesting. Do you support a local football team or a national one? Is there anyone from Liverpool? Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan and yeah, we don't tend to follow England that much. Um, would you want to live somewhere else? Do you consider yourself British or yeah, something more local? Um, is being from the North something you're proud of? Where is home for you? Are you interested in local history? Yes, yeah, so loads of good ideas there. Um, we'll save all these as well so we can share them after the fact. Um, the next question is, well, we're gonna do the survey ourselves. So to what extent do you actually agree with these statements? So imagine you're in the shoes of someone taking this identity questionnaire. You know, are you proud to be where you're from? Um, would you want to be from somewhere else? Do you think people from your area have a strong local identity? Um, and to what extent do you think where you grew up actually shaped who you are today? Okay, we can see updating live. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of high responses here. People strongly agreeing um, about being proud of where they're from. Got some more middle ground uh, responses as well. But interesting to correlate that with the actual places that people are from uh, as well. But we don't have time for that, unfortunately. Okay, now for the final two quiz questions where we can see who is the winner. Remember the fastest person gets the most points. So which of these speech styles is the most formal? We've got reading a passage, conversation, a narrative of personal experience, formal conversation, or reading out a word list.
do oh, oh. so yeah so any kind of reading task it will be more formal than a spontaneous conversation but but reading out a, a list of words is usually even more formal than a, a, a passage of text um, but they are both you know very formal okay so let's have a look what's that done to the scores it's drawn a spanner in the works look at that Okay, and now for the final question, which is the opposite. Which of the speech styles is the least formal? It's the same options as before, but now you're picking the least formal one. These are hard questions. So yeah, so a, a normal conversation is quite informal, um, but actually these narratives of personal experience are said to be the most informal kind of, of speech. This is when you're telling a kind of story. Um, Lebov was kind of known for saying oh, one of the best questions you can ask is tell uh, a danger of death question, a time where you thought you were gonna die, which you know is always fun. Okay, that's the last question. Let's have a look at the leaderboard and see who has won. Remember the top three get a prize. So Spam McSpamface is the winner. Um, and I, can we read the second and third? BG Read and SWGS with the crab emoji uh, are our top three. Um, I can't see below that. But anyway, we'll, we'll return to this um, at the end in terms of how to collect your prizes. Well done. I will stop sharing and hopefully we have some time for questions for Reese. I think we're a few minutes over. Yeah, we're a little over time, but we'll, we'll have time for at least mm -hmm. one question. So let's, there's one popped up in the chat from Chris um, for you, Reese. So um, to what extent do you think foreign accented speech is a reflection of speakers holding on to their local identity in a similar sense to Cornish speakers? Or do you think foreign accent and speech is, is different in that way? Yeah, I mean, so, so my research generally focuses on L1, so first language speakers of, of English. But um, yeah, generally, I would say that, that when it comes to uh, second language stuff, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly different situation um, whereby, you know, if people have acquired a particular language and a set of uh, let's say phonological rules of that language then it is uh, much more difficult uh, if not impossible to completely uh, get rid of that at some point in in adult life um, that's not to say that there aren't times when identity could be a factor there so you know i would argue that, that most of the time it's probably not going to to be uh, the most important thing but there could be times when people really want to, um, you know, stylize that that identity of, of their, their heritage language, or they may wish to to um, get rid of it in, in particular contexts. Um, so, so it may be sort of a minority of contexts in which that's really important. But, but most of the time, I'd say, yeah, it's sort of different different rules apply when it comes to uh, thinking about multiple languages. Yeah, that's great. Um... So if anyone else has questions for Reese, please pop them in the chat. And if we've got time in the final panel, we, we might be able to put another one to you, Reese. there. Uh, if not, we'll come back to you, your questions on the website or in some shape or form. Um, but thanks again, Reese, for a great talk. And um, just in the interest of time, I'll pass on to Sam for the next bit, which is the breakout rooms, a chance for you to discuss things with each other. Hi there. So um, some of you who've been to our um, online events before will know that in the last couple of years, we ran things as a, uh, a webinar. Um, but previously to that, we had in-person workshops in York. Um, and one of the advantages of a face-to-face -face workshop uh, was that you get this amazing sort of buzz of ideas as you guys as teachers are, are sharing ideas um, between you. And 
you're kind of an interesting self-selecting group of people who've chosen to come along and so that's really a rich uh, ground for um, interaction but you also get a bit of breathing space and and always the best uh, conversations always happen over coffee um, at any event like this um, so we wanted to provide just a little bit of breathing space in the program um, so and it's an experiment, let's see how it works, but we thought what we would do is um, put you in breakout rooms, so you're going to be randomly assigned to a breakout room in Zoom, which may or may not be your favourite thing to do, but um, let's go with it, see how it goes. Um, and you'll be in there with some other people on the call, um, somewhat at random, and we've got um, about five minutes, it's not very long. Um, but I'll, so we'll, we'll put you in there and uh, you don't have to join a group. You can stay in the main room if you prefer, but it gives you a chance to say hello to some other people. Um, and if you want to use that to come up with more questions, you can either post them in the chat when you come back or you can put them into your Mentimeter quiz. Um, we can record them there, which we'll be able to see as well. So we're going to put you into groups now. Um, I think there'll be about five or six people in each group if everyone joins. Is, is that working, Catherine? Um, I'm doing it automatically. I haven't got the pre-made ones, so I'll assign everyone automatically to five groups. So shall I click? Yes, that's now? what it should be. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. Um, if you're in a group um, and you want to, there's there's usually a button to say help, and if you click on the help button, one of us will come and talk to you. If you want one of us to talk to. And we'll call you back in about four or five minutes. So it really is just a quick hello. I'm sorry that was quite short, but I, I hope it was nice to at least see some other people and have a good, I don't know, whinge about whatever you feel or a good share of good ideas. Sorry, we can't give you coffee. Great, so I think everybody's got seven more seconds till the last people are kicked out. They're, they're chatting to the last moment, which is allowed. Excellent, so uh, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, and I'm gonna ask Dan Clayton now, um, last but not least, uh, to share his slides. And a big thank you to Dan, who is doing this despite currently being among the COVID positive. Um, Dan needs no introduction to an audience of English language teachers, but we're very grateful to him once again for giving his time uh, to contribute today. Um, he's got extensive experience of teaching English language as an AQA senior examiner, writing textbooks, English language blog, his, all his EMC uh, magazine workshop and conference work, and then also is one of the masterminds behind uh, the Lexis podcast. Um, so Dan is going to um, explore for us now how you can take the research you've heard about today and maybe some of our past uh, case studies and put it into practice. Thanks, Dan. Hey, Sam. Um, this is it gets easier all the time because all of these um, sessions are really great for being targeted to what we teach on the A level. So. Um, I'm sure that some of what I'll do will be, um, some of what I'll show you here will be fairly uh, fairly straightforward. Um, but what I'm also going to do is, is have a look back through um, some of the other case studies, because I think one of the things that we've now um, got access to is um, a really extensive uh, bank of resources that are just fantastic for A-level teachers to, to use. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's some great ones today, but we've now got 25 case studies, I think, if my counting's right. Is that right, Sam? 25, yeah. Um, and so these range from things like accent bias to multicultural London English. And we've got ones, you know, from baby talk to place names. Um, and most of the case studies can serve as a, as a useful model for English language A-level investigations. Not all of them. I think there's a, there's a couple that I'll, I'll mention later on where there might be approaches that we'd want to kind of focus on particularly with A-level students and other ones we might want to use a bit more in sort of classroom teaching for exams. Um, but all of them can be used in some form or other to support the teaching of the course. And there's a huge range, which is, you know, I think we should be really, uh, really pleased with and, and make use of. Um, OK, so in terms of um, the previous sessions, what I've what I've done is I've just kind of focused on a few that I thought would be would be useful. 
Um, and you can access all of these through the case studies drop down menu on the um, toolkit homepage. Um, and you can see them by the titles. And I've, I've put a few of these in here that we can refer to. So one, one sort of range of case studies I thought was interesting. And this, this is sort of coming from um, work that um, we've done on things like the, the language investigation um, are the ones that are to do with spoken language. And while students don't have to do spoken language as part of their language investigation, it's, it's very popular uh, sort of focus for, for students to have. And we see, you know, huge amounts of that every year with the NEA. Um, what you can see are these examples, I think, which are, are really quite helpful. So the question and answer sequences in conversation, language use in therapy by phone. I think that was last year's one, wasn't it? Um, and the language of courtroom questioning. So they're three that I thought were kind of useful for this. And I think, you know, one of the reasons for focusing on those three is because I think when we, you know, as teachers and moderators and, and people who see, you know, lots of, uh, lots of coursework along the way, we often see the same work being cited by students in their language investigations. So, you know, we see Grice, we see Giles, we sometimes see Sinclair and Coulthard. And, you know, there's good reasons for some of that. Um, but these three case studies that we can see here um, all open up really interesting areas, I think, for more precise and detailed investigations in some quite specific fields. Um, sometimes it's a little bit hard work to see students wrestling with uh, Grice's maxims and trying to apply them to uh, every single aspect of, uh, say, a celebrity interview carried out by uh, Piers Morgan or someone like that. So it might be it might be more useful to kind of focus on some of the specific kind of things that are um, shown by some of these case studies. Um, and, you know, not all of these will be for every student. I think, you know, particularly those that are aiming high, you'll find that these these can be really quite empowering case studies to look at because not only do they offer some really interesting background reading, but they offer some really good methodologies and might even spark a particular kind of interest in a, in a certain kind of focus that would really pay dividends in their, in their language investigation. Um, and it might be worth having a look through some of those and look at some of the methodologies as well as the sort of broad topic areas of them um, to have a look at how those kind of things might be applied to things like political interviews, uh, police interviews, we've certainly seen lots of interest. I think it's a bit of a strange interest in serial killers I've noticed in the last couple of years in, in language investigations, but certainly police interviews, there's lots of stuff on kind of, um, you know, reality TV shows with, with sort of police and courtroom stuff. Uh, celebrity interviews on talk shows and things like that, and they can provide some really interesting methodologies for that. So I'd recommend going back to have a look at those. Um, and then this will be, I can see Paul's here, but the uh, one of the, well, two of the case studies um, that Paul was responsible for um, have sort of gained a new, a new relevance, I think. I'm not entirely sure why this has happened, but MLE has been back in the papers again. And it's not even as if there was any new research on this. This sort of came about from, I think, the Daily Telegraph deciding that um, people were moving out of London. Um, and this might have been something to do with, with lockdown and things like that, or maybe just property prices and things, the rest of it, and rental crisis, and moving to other parts of the country and asking linguists about how that might affect the language being used in other parts of the country. And from that, and from a few interviews with linguists, a whole raft of stories appeared some of them, um, you know, quite interesting and linguistically uh, well informed, others definitely not. Um, and Paul's case studies on Jafakan and who made MLE are both really excellent for contextualising both the whole kind of growth of MLE, where it came from, how it came about, some of the contributing factors towards its, its creation as a multi ethnolect and as a changing multi ethnolect but also, and I think this relates to these stories, um, the Jafakan one, which is very much about media discourses, um, are really great for exploring what's been happening. I've just included a couple of screen grabs there of some of the, the stories. Um, so from The Guardian, The London Evening Standard, and this one over on the sort of bottom right, um, a particularly um, dubious one from The Mail Online. Um, and I think what we can also see um, is a really, well, I was going to say a nice example, but some pretty horrendous examples of how we might actually explain some of the key concepts from, from a couple of Paul's case studies. Um, 
is it in registrement? I was going to try and pronounce it with a French accent for some reason. Um, but it's a really good way of explaining these, you know, how a language variety becomes an index of a social group and later of a set of social characteristics. I mean, these um, examples of comments from the Mail Online um, are really pretty classic examples of how these things work. Um, the sort of social associations made um, between uh, you know, features of a multi ethnolect and the users of it. Um, and I think as well, you know, by looking at some of the, the, the case study background um, to MLE, students might be able to kind of you know, argue back against some of these discourses with some genuine linguistic knowledge that many of the writers, well, certainly the writers of these comments, but certainly maybe as well the journalists um, could do with as well. Um, and the extension tasks that I was having a look back at from the MLE and Jafakin case study uh, media pack are really, really good um, for exploring some of the things you could use in your classroom, particularly if you do AQA language discourses, it's perfect for that. So that sort of um, made me think back to those case studies from a little while ago. Um, and then that also links to two other case studies from previous years. So social category association, Carmen Yamas, Don Watt and Andrew McFarlane did this one and the accent bias Britain one um, that Don Watt again was involved with. Um, some interesting links there between pronunciation and attitudes. Um, attitudes and social categories are explored as well. And I know that many teachers already make use of Accent Bias Britain material, but there's some really good stuff here. And also I was reminded in the, um, the York MOOC as well is fantastic for introducing many of these ideas. And I would really recommend you know, teachers to sign up to that. And I know, you know there, there are several teachers who've recommended some of their sort of higher flying students use that MOOC as well. It's been fantastic, really good stuff. It's the first MOOC I've actually completed as well. So I was very proud of myself. Um, so there's some really good stuff there. Um, and while the um, social category association one um, focuses on Scottish English identity, I think, um, it's very good for looking at the whole idea of social meaning more generally. Um, and I think that's a really interesting concept which links with um, some of the stuff we've, we've seen today, particularly in Reese's uh, presentation. So on to today's case studies. Um, if we think about the first one um, from Chris Cox, I think clearly it doesn't take a genius to work out that the main focus of that will be on paper one child language development. But also I think, you know, child language investigations are really popular. There's lots of scope for using um, Chris's work on, um, on those as well. And just looking back at previous um, questions that AQA had set, for example, um, the evaluation question this summer was, input is more important than innate ability. And the one uh, a couple of years ago, nature is more imp important than nurture in a child's language development. Um, both of those would really give you some great examples to use as a student um, for how you might, um, you know, bring in some more up to date references to infant directed speech. Um, and again, you know, similar to what I was saying about some of the references we see to spoken language research, um, we do see again and again the same kind of references to Bruner and Skinner, for example, when there's any kind of input involved. And it would be really great to see some of these examples coming through in some of the, the ways in which um, you know, infant directed, child directed speech um, has been researched more recently. What's also interesting, I think, and this is something that struck me from, from listening to Chris's presentation as well, is that it, it's really interesting to have a look at the different functions of infant directed speech and how important they can be at different stages of language development. I think that's that's something that we often kind of forget. I mean, I certainly have when I've taught um, this, this aspect of the course is I often sort of focus on the uh, the forms of it rather than the functions. And I think there's, there's real scope there to explore um, more around that. Um, and I think one of the ways in which you might be able to do that with students is to get them to think about the questions suggested in the case study. Um, and I've just, you know, the examples I was thinking of here are the ones about language performing a socio-emotional role or language that helps in highlighting informative linguistic content could be a really good way of getting students to think a bit more carefully about the ways in which, you know, infant directed speech can be used rather than just describing, you know, its, its features. Um, and I think that can be a really good way of encouraging students, particularly when they're working on the stuff with the transcripts for paper one or in the NEA, um, to really engage with that data and think about you know, what it's being used for um, 
rather than just you know labeling features and i think as well it's it's really good to see that, that there's so many case studies on um, on child language development so the three other ones that um i think are there onomatopoeia exaggerated baby talk and iconicity um, are really helpful as well and if you look at those together there's a there's a great body of work there to use for this part of the course moving on to the second case study from Yulia um, I think this is this is slightly tricky to sort of pin down to a specific part of the course but I think it is a really useful thing for meanings and representations um, and also again for language investigations um, and I think what's good about case studies like this is that it really got me thinking about how um, you know, when we, we often encourage students and, and teachers to kind of, you know, feedback to their students that what we really want them to focus on sometimes is, is not just the labelling of features, but really to engage with how language is creating meanings and what those different meanings might be interpreted as. And I think this case study gave us a few sort of insights into that. Um, you know, certainly thinking about semantic relations as a concept and maybe a way of encouraging higher attaining students to explore the creation of meaning kind of beyond labeling and just identifying word classes but to think a little bit more about maybe a different kind of framework for exploring meaning um, but also um, scope really for investigations into how language uh, represents different people and groups particularly in media texts we've seen lots of that in recent years from students in their coursework um, and sometimes i think students often struggle to find kind of named theorists and ideas um, to help them with representation investigations and you know I think this this might give them a bit of ammunition um, and I was just scanning uh, Twitter uh, um, after the talk and I noticed that Jill Lavender pointed out that it could be really good for investigations into the use of these forms you know so um, the proper noun uh, genitive forms proper noun modifier forms in headlines in particular that you know there's a particular kind of genre isn't there where we might see a more compressed style, a more noun phrasey style. Um, and that might be really important, you know, so we've, we, we've certainly had the comments about, you know, Thatcher's government, the Thatcher government. There's been lots of students doing work on, um, well, the, you know, the Johnson government, Johnson's government, um, and many other kind of formulations of that. And, it, you know, there's interesting subtleties, aren't there, in the, in the ways in which those might be, you know, interpreted differently. And that could be a really interesting kind of strand of analysis in work like that. Um, again, I was thinking about sort of methodologies with this as well. Um, and I think in terms of ap application to language investigations, um, the standard gra grammaticality judgment task, um, the way that was adapted might be an interesting way of seeing, you know, what sounds or looks right in investigations that students might want to think about employing for, for other kinds of investigations as well. Okay, so on to the third and final case study, Reese's one. Um, I think there's a clear link here to paper two and language diversity and again to language investigations. And I think this is the kind of study that we could use straight away in the classroom to illustrate, maybe even to introduce um, key ideas around language diversity. Um, so, you know, I think one example might be this whole idea that non-standard forms, non-standard varieties can carry social meanings that are more positive than might be expected, um, that language and identity are intertwined, um, that people consciously and unconsciously vary their language in different situations. It's a great case study for illustrating those kind of things. Um, and, you know, how in different situations and speaking to different people, and also that, you know, as, as Reese was saying, the identity of the speaker themselves might be a really interesting angle to explore, but a great way of introducing this. Um, and, you know, there are some nice links to Trodgill and Lebov, um, and most students would study something from them at some point in the course. And there's some great stuff that links to discourses around accent and dialect attitudes. Um, so plenty of links there as well. But I think as well with language investigations, um, there's plenty of scope here as well. Um, I think it also shows the importance of a literature review. Um, you know, one of the things we often encourage students to do is read up on you know, who's done research in their field, who's written stuff, who are the big thinkers in their field before they start to you know, ask their own questions and go off and collect their own data. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of think, well, you know, would, would Reese's 
um, study have kind of existed without Lobov and Trodko. And I thought, well, I suppose we could ask, would any sociolinguistics exist without them? But, you know, those sort of those influences are really important. And I think that's it's really important to get students to kind of look at those kind of things and maybe sort of inform their thinking before they start putting pen to paper with their own ideas. Um, and also, I, I was really in, um, taken with the identity questionnaire as well. And I know that lots of the guidance about NEA has often said, be wary of questionnaires. But I think these are different. Um, you know, if you're simply using a questionnaire in a language investigation to elicit social attitudes, there's not a great deal of data there that you can explore. Um, and it will often just recycle social stereotypes. Um, but if you use an identity questionnaire as part of a wider kind of methodology, um, you know, to, ex to, to help students identify how people feel about certain varieties or their own language uses, and then use that as part of, you know, a wider discussion of data. That can be a really interesting approach and I think could sort of sit side by side with more conventional data gathering. So I think that would be an interesting one that I'd like to see, you know, I, I'm going to suggest that to students in, the, you know, months to come. Um, I think as well, there's another angle to this, which is really important, which is that there's strong kind of AO3 potential. So thinking about the kind of assessment objectives here, AO3 is very much to do with meaning, to do with meanings in contexts. And I think as well, you know, this is something really interesting with a study like this is that, you know, if you're simply sort of counting up things and looking at numbers, it's often quite difficult for students to engage with the meanings of those things. And often, you know, again, we, we've kind of discouraged students from doing that for language investigations. But once you start looking at social meanings, that can be that can be really relevant, I think, to AO3. Um, you know, what do these lexical features from Anglo Cornish mean? Those kind of things can go well beyond the literal things they're referring to, you know, the lunchbox or the tourist, into the realms of social meaning. You know, what do they communicate about the speaker's identity? What do they communicate about attitudes? Um, and I think that really does open up an area of AO3 um, that could be really, really interesting for students to pursue. So they're just a few um, suggestions. And um, just talking to, to people before everything started, just, just reminded that Reese has actually written an EMAG article about this as well. So I'd suggest having a look at that. That was in eMagazine 93 from September of last year, uh, where Reese talks a bit about his research, but also the sort of wider ideas that might be applicable um, for A-level students there. So that would be worth having a look at. So um, just to finish off, you know, thanks again for providing all of this material. It is brilliant to, to be able to look through it again. It's, I'd forgotten so much of it as well from the earlier workshops. It was good to go back through and explore it again. Um, and I think it's great for offering all these kind of new angles for us as teachers, you know, things we can feed into our teaching straight away. Um, there's, I think the index is still there, isn't it, with which Jill Lavender put together. And that's, that's really helpful for working your way through that. Um, and yeah, thanks very much again to University of York for, for doing this. It's such a great resource for teachers. And, you know, as, as an English language teacher, I'm super grateful for us uh, being able to make use of it. But thanks again. And I hope that gives you a bit of a sort of snapshot of some of the ways in which you can use it. Thank you, Dan. Well, we're extremely grateful to you for uh, meeting us in the middle and um, uh, checking that the materials that we produce are on the right track. Um, and one of the things we really like about these workshops is, is that we get to interact with you as teachers. And, you know, we do our research, um, but we, we're interested in doing something that's actually definitely useful for you. So um, I don't think we've got any questions yet in the chat for Dan, so don't hold back when those bubble up, let us know. I can see we've got a young participant in one of the screens, hello. You can do some infant directed speech now. Um, would you like a tangerine? Um, so um, any, any, I mean, we can do the questions in the chat or I think we're a small enough group at this stage because I think some people have had to leave that if you wanted to just pipe up verbally, you can just put your hand up either wave, turn your camera on and wave your physical hand or put, um, if you click on the reactions button, there's a raise hand button that you could use. Um, Dan, I'm, oh, Josh, you, Dan, you've been spared from my boring question. Josh, go for it. Are you happy to just ask? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Can you hear me? Is that all? 
Good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hi, Dan. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, you're absolutely right. I am relatively young. I'm, I've just finished my PGC year, actually, and I'll be doing my ECT year next year, mainly teaching A-level language. Um, the way that I've taught A-level language this year, my ITT year, has been very different to how my department will teach it next year. In terms of, I've mainly taught paper two in sort of like a vacuum. So I've taught theories kind of just as they are really. So I've taught students, this is what Trudgel said, this is what the match guy said, this is what, you know, et cetera, et cetera, for occupation and all the rest. But at my new college that I'll be teaching at um, next academic year, they tend, the, the way that they are doing things is they're kind of interspersing like all of the like other aspects of language into the theory. So like teaching Trudgel alongside phonology, you know, teaching other theories alongside Lexis, morphology, grammar, all the rest. So I suppose the question that I've got as a ITT or as an ECT is how how would you recommend me go about kind of doing that, like drip feeding them theory, but also implementing it, like constantly drilling their knowledge of Lexis, semantics and grammar and stuff with, with that theory. Does that make sense? It does. It's, it sounds like quite a tall order, though, doesn't it? It does, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think it will probably come down to your use of examples, won't it? Um, and I think that's probably the the case for a lot of things to do with introducing language methods and language levels and things like that, as well as some of the the case studies and research is is to find specifics. Um, and and find ways in which you can link those to the sort of bigger picture um and i think yeah i mean that there are there are maybe examples i mean i suppose with with phonology that would be an interesting one because you could i i mean i i probably wouldn't myself teach phonology as a separate kind of language framework until i was doing some stuff that i thought was directly relevant to it like for example child language development yeah. um or the ways in which you know different variables might appear in different variants might appear in, in in people's language based on a kind of regional regional accent or something like that um so yeah i suppose examples might work um yeah i think i think it's it's a tricky one I, i'll have to give that some thought and i mean maybe if we could swap emails i can i can have a think about that one <laughs> i've got a slightly more a less befuddled brain as well yeah of course but yeah but yeah, yeah no it'd be no it'd be interesting to it'd also be interested to see what you know what their approach is and how that works um yeah because it seems it seems like that's that could be quite tough um but yeah let's let's swap let's swap ideas about that yeah that's fine i'll message you on twitter or something yeah yeah okay, okay brilliant yeah thank you Dan. And, and josh and any other teachers here i think you'd be very welcome to ask us for ideas um, you know, just tweet us or send us an email, because although we 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 pick particular studies to present in this context and we work them up as sort of case studies, we all teach the full range of everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you need an example between the bunch of us, we can probably find you one pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, so uh, we when we prepare these things, our uh, the teacher I'm thinking of is a teacher at half past ten on a Sunday night who's thinking, rude word, I've got to teach on X tomorrow. Um, so we may or may not answer your tweets at half past ten, but we might. So um, just ask. We'd be very welcome to um, um, uh, answer. And there's going to be other people around who can can help out. Um, I think I'm going to take the questions more broadly now to the whole panel and also give Dan a rest. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for all of that. We've got time just for a couple of questions that were asked earlier that we didn't uh, have time for. I thought th this is a question for Chris um, from Rahima, which I thought was a great question. So um, Chris, are you primed? Yep. Um, so Rahima asks, where do adults pick up IDS from? Is it intuitive? Um, no one really teaches us to modify our speech for babies, but we all do it. Yeah, I thought that was a really great question too. Yeah, and I've been thinking about it um, 
as well during the other talks as well. Um, and there are some theories that say that um, maybe infant directed speech, the reason why it's higher in pitch is because we're trying to imitate the infant vocal tract. So because infants have smaller vocal tracts, maybe the pitch, uh, maybe the heightened pitch is sort of a way to, for us to emulate their vocal tract and helping them learn language in that sense. Um, it's also similar to how we uh, address cats. So, um, or cats in my case, I have a cat right next to me. <laughs> um, where pet directed speech, right, it also feels very intuitive. And I was thinking about cats meowing and whether we're trying to emulate the cats meowing um, in that sense by addressing them with a higher pitch. Um, so I thought in a similar sense to infants, maybe that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make our vocal tract smaller to, to better approximate their um, vocal tract. It's also got something to do with, with soothing infants at a distance, right? So, um, so that's an evolutionary theory of why we do infant-directed speech as well, that maybe, we, maybe it's a way for um, caregivers to um, comfort or soothe their infants from a distance as opposed to through touch. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure that that answers <laughs> a question, but, um, but those are some thoughts that I had um, going on after that question for sure. Thanks. Yeah. And there's a comment there from Rebecca. And also, Rebecca, you had a, a question earlier. Um, Ella, thank you for your... Um, sorry that you have to go. Yes, um, we will uh, send you your prize. You were the top uh, person who wasn't actually a member of the staff team who accidentally won. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask uh, your follow-up question, Rebecca, or you could ask it yourself to Chris, well, and or to whoever really, which was about um, whether um, is it would you would we be right in assuming that IDS or child-directed speech is used for longer periods and into adolescence or even adulthood adulthood for caregivers of people with um, a disability? Yeah, do does, it have a, does it have a different name? Go ahead, Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah, Jill. Jill kind of came back with a, a kind of comment that there was a, a study that. A student had done so I can look into that but yeah I'm just interested in um that the way that it would be perhaps re renamed perhaps or would it have a similar um kind of set of criteria um and, and is it socialized is it something that we see across the kind of caregiver community or is it something that's perhaps dependent mm, yeah so I mean I know there's um there are lots of comparisons with in, between infant directed speech and, for example, foreigner directed speech. So whether these two are similar, um, also between infant directed speech and pet directed speech, as I was saying before. Um, and there are subtleties in how we address the uh, the person we're speaking to, right? Um, simply just through accommodation, right? We're trying to make the task of communicating easier. Um, I know also there are there are some studies of um, caregivers uh, or comparing caregivers uh, of um, infants with autism to to typically developing infants where we see differences between those two as well. Um, and all of these studies really just emphasize the infant directed speech is this interactive process, right? It's not a unidirectional thing, but it's a thing that arises from the interaction between the caregiver and the infant. So I think um, in terms of describing it as a, you could describe it as a speech style, right? Mm -hmm. um, simply as accommodation between the speaker and the and the person that they're addressing it to. Um, yeah. I think it'd be interesting to um, look at sort of not knowing that you're addressing an infant. So I'm thinking about some of the emergency response calls for 999 when you realise that the handler is dealing with a sort of five-year-old with a, a mother that's, you know, knocked out on the bottom of the stairs, pregnant or whatever it might be. Um, and how they have to have that infant directed speech, but they have a really important job to do. So it's yeah. kind of whether there's a modification within the IDS there, because it's also sort of function dependent is really life, you know, life saving. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good, uh, well, that's a good example of when, when it's very important to, <laughs> to, to use infant directed speech, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, as always happens, the um, conversation is just getting going and we have to end. Um, and when we've met in person in York, this was the point when everyone wants to talk for ages, but they all have to run for their trains. And um, Yulia actually has to run for a train. So thank you very much for, uh, to Yulia for uh, being here. Um, 
I would, um, I'm just going to uh, share a couple more final points um, on my screen, if I may. So um, first of all, is to congratulate the winners of our quiz. So the top one were SWGS and then goodbye, Calvin. Who was that? Are, you, are they still here? Yeah. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Salvador, whoever that is. Um, anybody want to come to admit? Anyway, well, um, we will, if you get in touch with us, we will send you your free posters. Woo. Um, the, after this workshop, I'm gonna, they're gonna, um, of course, send you um, a, a survey to get your feedback. And we'd really like your feedback on this format, how, which, what worked, what didn't, um, how, how should we do things for another time? Because we're very open to different formats. So we, we will take suggestions and we're aware that you're cramming this in, in a, a busy schedule and a busy time of year. Um, there'll be a recording of the whole workshop on the website in a couple of days, as soon as we've got that ready. And everyone who's been here today will get a certificate of attendance. Um, but in the longer term, we'd like to hear from you. And even if you didn't win in the quiz, you can still get your paws on a free set of post posters by filling in our feedback form. Um, and just tell us something you've done with some of our materials, even the smallest thing. We, you know, every little thing is really useful to us um, because as universities, we have to sort of account for ourselves. And one of the things we've done recently is um, sort of submit a case study of our case studies. Um, and it was uh, really highly rated. So we're really grateful to all of the teachers who gave us feedback that allowed us to explain uh, what we do. But um, you, you can't end up with all of the rich materials that you've got on the website and the content you've seen today without real team effort. And you've got all the faces here today. I'd like to single out Ben, who's got a particularly smiley face with glasses there who has created all the teaching materials um, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a version of this with names on it so that you know who's who um, but I think then we are officially um, running out of time it's one minute past five so I would like to thank you all for coming um, don't hesitate to contact us by email or tweet or use our feedback form um, and we look forward to seeing you next year or sooner if you if we do something else. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Just I'm just going to save the chat. And then I'll end the meeting. Thanks everybody. Sam, is it possible to literally just have 30 seconds? Yeah. Is that okay? Ahead. I'm sorry, I know it's really late on a Friday night. No, no, it's <laughs> fine. Go ahead. Um, is it all right? I don't know. I don't want to interrupt anybody else's. Yeah. It was no. just to sort of just have a bit of a heads up that I um I definitely will need some support in the next year or so. So having taught English for 20 years, I'm at the point of teaching A level for the first time, believe it or not. Um, because I was at an 11 16 setting. Right. I've just moved in the last two years to an 11 to 18 setting so it's just to kind of just wave because i'll be the person emailing and tweeting constantly all for the Good. next year um <laughs> and you're in fulford yeah i'm at fulford yeah and yeah. I'm, really, I'm really conscious of my experience is linguistics degree and then msc in speech and hearing science so kind of pitching i don't want to you know i've got absolutely no experience of teaching the a level but i don't want to drop down anything from the degree and, and do that in a sort of top-down way I want to build them up so it was just to kind of get a steer really and I'll definitely be the person asking you a million questions you're going to regret saying that you're there to help on Twitter well we, well, we are <laughs> I mean on one level our problem is that we're not the we're not A-level teachers either no so I would commend um Jill's um, materials to you and indeed yeah. just Jill I mean Jill, Jill, <laughs> Jill and I worked together for one, one precious year before she ditched me so um, um, yeah <laughs> yeah um, I'm going to go to Jill's garden and, and find out what she's got to say but yeah um, but um, but I think all of our materials have been through the sort of filter of teachers looking at them yeah. and telling us what they think of them so I right. think they give you you know and you've always got Dan's comments on them from his talks each year where he, he gives you specific suggestions yeah. of what would be good to do and what not to do right. there's coded messages in there yeah. saying oh only for the stronger students yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is good code for um for how to use things
So yeah, lovely to meet you and lovely to meet other people who are on the call who, who we're not yeah. able to talk to quite so freely, but yeah. we're really grateful that you've all come. Oh, no, it's today. fabulous. Thank you to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good weekend, Have everyone. Weekend. And um, the, the staff team, we've got another call to go and meet in to debrief. So we'll, we'll go and do that. Thank you, everybody. Um, and see you next year, if not before.